Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Tonight, episode 90, and you'd think I'd know after just looking at that. <laughs> every time I forget. It's like, I tip my tongue, I go to say it, it's gone. Absolutely gone. But anyway, episode 90, and tonight we're going to be talking about how to stay warm in extreme cold. And we're not talking about your normal winter day. We're talking like... Uh, or in my mind, what I'm thinking about is much like we did, but in a, an extreme situation, you go out, you plan to stay overnight when it's snowing, something happens, temperature drops. And now you're into like extreme colds, minus 20, minus 30, uh, add some wind chill in there maybe pushing minus 40. How do you stay warm when the temperature gets that cold? It can almost take your breath away. And there is some things you can do. Uh, so we're talking summer day in my hometown, right? Exactly. Like, this is kind of like the average day at Rec House. And if anybody knows Newfoundland, <laughs> they'll know what Rec House is. And, <laughs> yeah, a Not normal day at Rec House. Rec House is just windy. <laughs> it is, but in the winter, it is bitter cold. Because it takes that wow. wind right off the ocean. And, man, it is cold. It, but... it is. Um, yeah, so we're, we are talking hey, extreme hey, cold. Hey. And, basically, I think we're kind of talking. Hey, hi, Daddy. Come on over. A little closer. There you go. Yeah, Daddy's Hi. talking to Ben. Yeah, I'm talking to Ben. All right. Yeah. Say goodnight. Goodnight. Night. <laughs> so we're kind of you know, two potential situations, really. One is that you're you're there and prepared. But two, I think the more likely conversation we want to discuss is you're prepared for a night, but not necessarily to the temperatures that are it's gone down to. And yeah, and that's real easy to get into, especially here in Atlantic Canada and stuff like that. Like the, the weather's a crapshoot at best. Uh, I swear they just look outside and that's how they say the weather. Oh, it's sunny. Well, if you look out the window, sure enough, that's what it is. But anything beyond that, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, and we, we do get close to temperature ranges and other places do too. We're not going to say that this is the, the worst in the world, but a lot of places, you know, you can definitely go up or down 20 to 30 degrees in, in a 24 hour period. And, and that's not uncommon. I mean, this morning, I think it was minus seven tomorrow. We're looking at plus 13 or Friday, like in, in, in not, not a very big skip span of time. We're moving 20 degrees in temperature. Oh yeah. So, and look at the other day there. Uh, I can't remember what night it was. It wasn't last night, maybe the night before we had a real, real warm night at like 1130. It was almost 20 degrees. Mm. And then again, and like you said, this morning it was down to minus seven. And then yeah. tomorrow or Friday, whatever you say, like the temperature's all over the place. Uh, and it's pretty common in Canada and pretty, I don't think it's that far off from a lot of other places either, like you said. No. So, yeah, so you get out there. Let's, let's set a situation so we can kind of get ourselves on the right page. You're gone out for a night. You're, you're expecting temperatures around freezing, but it drops to minus 20. Um, your bag you took was rated for minus five, six. So not really adequate for the temperatures you're going to get, but what should have been doable, although maybe a bit cold for the temperatures you're expecting. So there's a situation. Now, now how do you, how do you get the best of this? And I think in that situation, unless you happen to have a, a bunch of spare gear hidden somewhere, you're going to have to make do with with some pretty basic skills and the very first one i'm going to throw out there is boosting your shelter um i mean if you can insulate your shelter and you have to heat a smaller area then there's a difference between the area you're inhabiting and the outside so you can warm that small area up better and then that sleeping bag may be much closer to its range so if your shelter was originally a tarp or a tent, now you may be looking at trying to boost that by maybe putting some debris and stuff on top of that and just trying to create that extra barrier. Um, and not all debris to... is equal when it comes to trying no. to boost your shelter. And I guess that's something people should be aware of too. Is like everybody thinks, oh, we'll throw some, st well, not everybody, but some people think that you throw some sticks over it and boom, you just, you got a better shelter. You have a more rigid shelter, but it's not giving you any more thermal protection. No, uh, I mean, ideal situations, you're looking at nice, fluffy, dry leaves, maybe a couple uh, of plastic barriers to create a good windbreak, hold it down. Um, mosses are, are okay, 
there's different things you can use to create that that barrier but that's exactly what i think one of my first things i would start is, is creating that better barrier and the other thing is protecting you from the ground because a lot of heat you're going to lose is is to whatever you're laying on uh in this situation i'm not assuming a hammock because that actually does get a little bit more complex uh, not that it's not doable it's just a, a, another layer that you'll have to deal with um so a good bed of, of boughs or, or something underneath you that's going to keep you off that ground, keep that ground from chilling you out, but giving you that, that barrier and keeping moisture off you. So that's starting. I mean, you want to add something to that? Uh, the only thing I'd like to add into that really before we move on is not only should you boost your shelter, if you have the ability to make your shelter smaller so that you have to heat or keep warm a smaller area. So in Ben's instance where he set a tarp, maybe you pitched a nice big tarp. You got lots of room on either side of you, a great big air pocket in front of you. Well, something you can do that'll help a little bit is narrow that in. Just give yourself enough space inside to cover yourself over, um, give you enough room to breathe so nothing's actually touching you, moisture and condensation can't build on you and stuff like that. But just the bare minimum room you need because now the little bit of heat that may be expended from your body and stuff like that potentially can stay trapped in there maybe it won't keep it warm warm like house warm but now you're not trying to warm such a large area the the loss of heat um from convection conduction will be less because you have that much what the much less area to try and fill the void with uh and then start you know beefing up your shelter a little bit in in the ways that ben was talking about there and uh a good one that also works is snow snow is a great insulator that's an awesome insulator. Um, in fact, if you can get away with it, going into a, a, a snow cozy or Quincy hut or whatever you want to call it, um, instantly you are actually going to see a, a major difference in temperature. So once you get get that area closed in, like you said, you don't want an overly big area. Believe it or not, just a couple of candles inside, probably like a foot thick walls will warm up to around or just above zero degrees in there pretty quickly. Uh, much higher than that, and your your shelter itself starts to melt, and that, that's obviously a bit of a problem. But if it's minus 20-something inside, and it's about one or two degrees inside, the clothes on your back and your sleeping bag is going to be more than enough to keep you very comfortable. Um, in fact, I've, I've definitely experienced that. So I agree 100% with you. Getting that shelter down, getting that 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 layer gives you a huge boost uh, to that to to that system to get getting you down there, and I think that's probably one of the first areas I would Rainbow. aim Rainbow. towards. Uh, some people might jump and say, "Well, just build a bigger fire." I mean, yes, building a bigger fire is is an option, but you have to maintain that fire, and that's going to be a lot of work. And if you want to get a nice big fire and use that to keep yourself warm all night you're talking about you know i'm not saying cords of wood but maybe gonna be approaching you know well depending on the wood. weather you're in like i'm thinking if you get trapped in well not trapped but maybe unexpectedly hit with a, a snow squall or something like that where there's a lot of wind a lot of blowing snow i mean it, it if you have to go away from your fire to try and retrieve more wood you might actually be doing worse off than trying to hunker down your shelter and wait it out. Yeah, um, agreed. I think a, a, a fire is definitely a help and you can definitely use that fire to boost things. And, and there's a, a few things you can do. If the fire is close to your shelter and it's reflecting some heat towards you or, or clumping heat towards you, that's great. Obviously with a fire and shelter, you kind of have to be somewhat careful. You don't want to A, burn your shelter, B, smoke yourself out. Um, so you do have those struggles and you want to protect all your gear, like your sleeping bag and all that. So depending on what, how you're de dealing with that, uh, you do have to be somewhat careful. Uh, I've definitely watched gear get melted and damaged of it being too close to a fire. So I'm not a big fan of having my fire super close to my shelters. Um, especially if they're big and, and not well controlled. Mm -hmm. But uh, a fire is great, and you can heat things up with a fire. And there's a few things that you'll want to consider heating up. One is a rocks that you can pull into or near your shelter. That'll radiate heat out for, for quite a while before they lose their heat completely. 
The other thing is water. Heating a, 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 a bottle, especially a, a, a metal bottle, and wrapping it in some of your clothes that you're not wearing, you can throw that into your sleeping bag, and that's going to, again, radiate that heat out for a while and really boost that sleeping bag's uh, ability uh, quite a lot. Uh, something as simple as one of those body warmers, a trick I actually learned from you. Uh, yes. Just in like the small of your back and uh, if if you're huddled, if you can get it in between your legs, like anywhere where it's very vascular, inside your arms, where there's blood flow, that, that can actually go a long way to keeping you at least a bit more comfortable. Yeah. Um, and I keep, I, I have the large body warmers in my first aid kit and anytime I'm going and I, I question my sleep system, I'll throw a couple extra in the pack. And oftentimes if I'm going with someone else, I throw a couple in for them because they really don't weigh that much. They don't take up any real amount of room in my pack. And I, for, for the few ounces that each one of those weighs, uh, if it helps me or, or anyone I'm camping with, then I'm more than happy to, to lug that weight. And that's exactly it. Throwing one of those in the bottom of my sleeping bag, I swear, gives me five or six degrees temperature uh, that I will go down in that sleeping bag. Um, so that's that definitely brings it up. You get the similar effect with that hot water bottle, and that's something you can kind of heat up and cool down and, and reuse a bit more. But those are both great options. Something you can put in the sleeping system into your 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 close to your skin. Like you said, if you put it inside your thigh under your armpit that really warms your whole body up um, so that helps for sure so that those are two methods we've already talked about um is boosting your shelter adding heat into your shelter system using either a fire or those chemical packs another uh, huge one go ahead no i was just going to say i do have one last thing i want to say on those heater packs um you can get chemically activated ones or air activated ones um both have their their place don't get me wrong my only two cents i'm gonna add in there is uh on the air activated ones i have run into the problem where i actually took some hunting with me this year and i thought mm -hmm. uh, i didn't have very good footwear uh so i said oh hey i'll just break these open i'll throw them in my boots and it'll keep my feet warm you know what i mean if it gets cold so it never really got cold enough this year to really be a problem uh before i tagged out so no big deal but i was like screw it i got like 10 of these things i'm gonna try one so I broke it open. It says it takes about 20 minutes to come up to full heat. Once it got warm, things were great. Threw it in my boot. Just kind of loosely set my foot in there. But however, by doing that, I guess I blocked enough of the air off that that heater pack went cold. So that's something yeah. to keep in mind too. Uh, now for me, I'm probably going to start looking for the chemical activated ones. They're kind of in a sealed pouch. Yeah, you still break them open and it's all internally chemically activated and the air is not such a big deal. But that was something I didn't take into consideration when I originally bought those heater packs and said, oh yeah, I'll just throw them in my boots and keep my feet warm. Great idea. Didn't work in practicality. So just food for thought for anybody out there that's thinking the same thing. Uh, learn from my mistake, I guess. Yeah, so the air activated ones in like a sleeping bag, you're not sealed to that level. It's not going to consume all that oxygen. I haven't had a problem with those, but I can see that in a boot, especially a waterproof boot, it, you're air limited. So then the, it'll release very little heat, but it'll probably last a long, long time. It'll only give you a few, say, degrees in there while they're in your boot. You have to take them out for a while, warm them up, and put them back. So it definitely is a little bit of an issue. The uh, chemically, the ones, the ones that are in like a sealed bag with a little disc in it you break. Um, I found some in the dollar store. They come with little knit, knitted mitts to go in them uh, recently. So you can buy little ones. They're very small. Uh, we bought them from Lee Valley years ago, and they are reusable. You, you throw them in boiling water. They heat up. They go back to a, a liquid. And then you, when you break that disc, they activate. The only problem I have with those, and they work well, they don't last quite as long as the air activated ones is sometimes they randomly go off on their own. Yeah. Once upon a time, Mel bought some, it was a set. There was a couple shaped, I can still picture it. There was a big one, two of them were shaped like feet and there was two small ones. And I can remember we literally had them stored in the nightstand because she used to use them literally for going to bed. Uh, sometimes it was cold. We have wood heat here in our bedrooms at the far end of the house so sometimes it's a little colder there she'd break one of those open throw it in the bed because you can reset them and just sitting in the end table uh she opened it and went to use it and the two big ones had already gone off and yeah. they were hard again so yeah that, that is something to definitely keep in mind so another thing 
believe it or not, is just eating. Uh, a full stomach um, produces quite a bit of, of heat while digesting food like that. It, it work it takes to digest the food will actually heat you up. So if you eat just before you go to bed that at night, you will actually be warmer than if you, you, you go to bed hungry. Actually, instead of typing all this out, Troy asked the question, um, what are those hot packs like for your hand? And what I was typing out to him, if you could hear me rattle in a way there, and I might as well answer this question, was the hot packs for your hands? Awesome. Uh, the ones I tried in my boots, like we were talking about, they kind of went cold, pulled them out, gave it a couple minutes, boom, they're right back up to temperature. Now, if I after I learned that they won't work in my boots, I just kind of threw them in my the pockets of my jackets. And anytime my hands were getting any any bit of chilliness to them i just throw them in my pockets and within minutes they'd be nice and toasty warm so those air activated heater packs work great in my pockets you could probably stuff them in your gloves it would still be fine as ben said anything that breathes they're gonna still work really well it's just when you get them in a real oxygen deficient environment my boots were basically uh uh i don't know they're like a knockoff bog or something like that they're like not really a rubber boot they're more of a neoprene kind of boot and uh yeah they they did not work well in there and i thought you know okay well i'll just throw them in the bottom and i'll just loosely put my feet in and hopefully the heat will radiate up nope within like three minutes those packs were ice cold like they had never been went off it, it was the weirdest thing how fast they actually cooled off uh but no it, pockets anywhere where samir can get at them they work great and they last a long time i think the ones i have were 10 hour ones and literally, like, at least eight hours later, because uh, my father-in-law and I had actually timed it. Eight hours later, they were still, like, toasty warm. Not getting cold by any means. So I, I don't know if they'll go the full ten hours, but I can guarantee you they'll go for eight hours. Which is definitely a decent night's sleep in the woods, would you not say, Ben? I, I can't remember the last time I got a full eight-hour night's sleep in the woods during cold weather. Uh, honestly, yeah, um... Two weekends ago, I was in the woods with Chris, and uh, we uh, I took one and threw it in the bottom of my sleeping bag. And when I got home the next day, I had taken it out of the sleeping bag and put it in my pocket. I got home the next day. So that was, say, 10 o'clock at night. I opened one of those and threw my sleeping bag. The next day, around 2 or 3 o'clock, when I handed it to my daughter, it was still making heat. So I was getting heat for quite a while out of that. Now, maybe in the sleeping bag, down by my feet, it may have not been producing as much heat as it could have. It may not have been getting full air because it was inside clothing and stuff and somewhat restricted. But it was still producing heat all night, and it produced heat during the day. And like I said, when I was coming back, I had it in my pocket. I warmed up my hands when we were paddling. So it, they work. They're, they're very good, uh, and I think they're, they're very much worth it. Um, and they're not that expensive. Christopher Loveless said he bought a pack of 40 of them for like $7 on Amazon. I didn't get a 40 pack, but I think I had like a 10 or 20 pack and it was only five, six bucks too. I found them at Mark's, uh, not Mark's work warehouse, uh, workman's what's that place called? I think it's just Mark's now. I don't know, but anyway, it, they're not expensive. You can find them readily. Um, so hopefully that answers your question a little bit there, Troy. Uh, and just, while we're on the note there, just like to say hi to everybody that joined us live here tonight. We got Troy, we have Danny, we got Chris, we got Christopher. Uh, we got a pretty good, pretty pretty good audience with us tonight in the comments there or the live chat. So hopefully they'll add their input in here too. Um, so yeah, we talked about beefing up your shelter or adding some more thermal layering to it to not to try and trap heat in and around you, as well as keep the cold and wind out. We talked about uh, adding fire or heat. Uh, and some of the things you have to be aware of there, but more specifically, maybe heating up some rocks or uh, some water bottles or something like that and creating your own kind of hot pack. We've talked about the hot packs. Um, and we mentioned it at the first, but if, if you're good to move on, Ben, the one I'd like to talk about is separating yourself from the ground or putting some thermal layering under you and a couple different ways yeah. you can do that as well. Yeah, go ahead with that. So the number one way to do that is uh, let's assume you got uh, stuck and it's snowing uh, in this instance snow is not going to be the best insulator that you can put underneath you because one it's going to melt as your heat hits it uh and that's going to make you wet so why is not your friend no no and uh, i mean you've heard other people say uh you sweat you die well it's it's not just you sweat you die you get wet and it's cold you're going to lose significant amount of heats to the point where it could potentially endanger you. So you have to keep yourself dry as well. 
And the best way to do that is to layer something underneath you. So that may be having to revamp your shelter. Once again, if you're tarp uh, camping or something like that, especially if it's like one of those Canadian tire jobbies, one of those, you know, poly tarps, something like that. It's hundred percent waterproof. You can kind of do a triangular way to it. So instead of just having your pitch like this, you can actually, while you're shrinking your size down, you can bring the triangle in and then under you and then kind of raise that last side. So you're not pulling water into you or under you. Uh, and that's going to give you that dampness barrier, but you still need something under that to get you away from the ground. So spruce boughs work good. Uh, any kind of fir tree works good. They might be inherently slightly damp, but they offer quite a bit of uh, airspace in between them. They, they act as an air cushion because they have all those needles. It's going to give you, uh, it's actually fairly soft. Have you ever slept on a bow bed? I've slept in a, in a, in the boughs and they're still in the tree, man. <laughs> I can't see. Yes, I have. Found this tree one time. There's these, these two or three branches, and they were in, intertwined. And we actually lid on top of them, and it kept us like a, a foot or two off the ground. And I just slept there for a period of time. It was awesome. I can't say as I've ever managed to do that, but I have slept on a bow bed. And if I'm making a semi-permanent shelter, meaning, and keyword making it, uh, I, I like to use like the uh, super shelter design with an open front. So you make a lean to cover in your sides. So you have like a, a, a I'm just yeah. trying to do this with the camera, but it's hard. You have kind of a pitched roof. You would be here. You have your two sides in and a fire in front of you with a little bit of a reflector wall or a, a windshield wall, whatever you want to call it. You know, the yeah. arguments there, that's a whole other show. Um, but then if you stake in some posts and put a couple bigger logs on the outside and kind of literally just make a box and just stuff that thing full of uh, fir boughs is what I like because I prefer the smell of fir trees, but that's not always what you can get there. Spruce, I find the needles are a little stiffer. Uh, sometimes you have to maybe watch out for those. They can poke and not make you comfortable. But if it's an emergency situation, trust me, the uncomfortableness is worth not freezing to death. But if you have the time and the nicety, fur seems to work really well. Pine works really well, except pine tends to be really sticky. Uh, but yeah. in any case, uh, get it stacked. Like if you, if you're only going for two or three inches, you're literally just defeating yourself. Don't waste your effort if you're going to do this do it right you want to go somewhere between six and eight inches get yourself a good thick layer of boughs um more like the fan leaves or the fan needles at the end of it less the branches get that sucker packed up nice and tight i like to put my face down with the uh the stems stalks limbs branches whatever you want to call it kind of pointed in and down that way they don't poke up and get you in the middle of the night and if you get like eight inches of those that is literally like I've slept on couches that were less comfortable in all honesty. Oh, yeah. No, it, it can be very comfortable. Um, and, and you're right. You, you are looking for that, that six to eight inches or more. If you can do it, the reality is what I think a lot of people miss with this is this is not a five minute build. No, uh, getting those kind of bows, even if you're lucky and, and you're, you find a, you're in place, say close to an, a, a relatively recently, say like the last five to eight years cut over, you can go, you can limb some of those Christmas tree sized trees and, and you can get quite a good shelter relatively quick, but it still takes a fair bit of work to put it in, get it in there right. And after the first night or two, that eight inches is much more like four. So then you might want to add, add a couple more. If you're doing multiple nights, you do tend to go back a little bit and they do dry out some. No, for uh, sure. And, and I have to agree with you. Not all evergreens are created equally. <laughs> hemlock is not an, uh, he hemlock's actually not bad, but hemlock no. tends to have like uh, more stick to needle ratio. So oh, it yeah. takes a lot of them to go juniper or uh, a warch or whatever you want to call it. Same kind of deal. Uh, Christopher Lovelace asks, what's the rule of thumb for cutting spruce boughs down? I always thought you're supposed to cut them off uh, or you're not supposed to cut them off the tree. But they would, uh, it would seem pointless to cut it off a dead tree. Okay, so rule of thumb, survival situation, do what you need to to survive. First and foremost, I don't think anybody is going to hold you accountable or really bat an eye if you cut down a couple green trees to save your life. I mean, I, I've never heard of a situation where anybody's gotten in trouble for that. Now, if it's not a survival situation, you're just out there doing your due. Um... There's, there's really not a rule of thumb there, except there's... 
you're better off taking the tips off uh, evergreens than cutting them off at the base of the tree because then they actually have a little bit of room for regrowth towards the fall. Um, it doesn't really matter because there's not a lot of growth there. But in the spring, uh, you get a thing called green up where the tree takes all of its moisture and stuff like that from the trunk and innards and tries to put into new growth where things get really dry. Uh, you're going to find like only the last six to eight inches of the bough is going to actually have any loft to it to begin with. True. Um, yeah. And, and I, I, th I think we really have to think of it just like I've generally gotten away from making natural shelters because it does take a lot of work. You are tending to kill good trees. Uh, it's it's a, part, a big part of the reason I went to the hammocks, the underquilts, and even using more and more like lightweight, per, uh, reusable shelters, if you, if you will. Um, but that is a skill. Like making a natural shelter is a skill, and it's a worth skill to learn. And I think it's important for people to give it a try. Um, so if you're doing that, yeah, you are going to kill some live trees. And I don't think it's something you should be doing every time or planning on doing. But again, if it's down to freezing or you're stuck and you know it's going to get a lot colder than you expect, you had expected when you left, then that, that may be your option. Um, and one or two trees in a good, healthy forest is not really going to hurt the forest. It's not really going to hurt anything. Uh, trust me, the wild animals in that forest are doing much more damage themselves. Moose kill hundreds of trees every year when they eat the nice new growth off of them. That doesn't mean that forest is dying. It means the, the trees next to it simply could grow better because it's not crowding them. So, you know. And yeah, I guess to expand on that a little bit, um, if you see, I guess we don't have any videos from where we were camping at the waterfall, but if you have uh, like a lot of evergreens around that are fairly tall and then a whole bunch under them that are short, chances are those short ones are going to die off anyway. Uh, generally they grow up in the spring when the needles aren't as thick, they get a little bit of light in there as the summer comes on, they get, uh, sun deprived cause sh they get shaded in and then they just kind of turn sickly scrawny and disappear anyway. So, um, harvesting them isn't such a bad thing as Ben said there, but yeah, it's never good to kill a dead tree or sorry, kill a live tree. <laughs> um, but if you have your choice between a hardwood and a softwood, softwood grows significantly faster than most hardwoods. Uh, things like black spruce, they grow incredibly fast. Red spruce, they grow incredibly fast. Uh, spruce trees in general tend to grow incredibly fast, followed by fir trees. I, I'm not really 100% sure on the pine or larch. I think they're they're still fairly quick, maybe not as quick. I, I, I don't know on those, but I do know that spruce, it, it grows really rapidly. Um, a lot of logging companies and stuff like that, they got like 50 year turnarounds on these things. They flatten it, they replant, and 50 years later, they're going back in to cut more pulp kind of deal. So that gives you an idea how quick they grow as comparatively to like hardwoods. A hundred years later, you're just starting to get a half decent tree. Yeah. So all food for thought on that one as well. Anyway, we kind of digressed. <laughs> Neither of us are, are big proponents of destroying an entire forest, but one or two trees is, is a to totally different matter, I think, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but, yeah, we're talking survival here. We're talking, you know, having a fire. Obviously, with the fire, we do tend to, to look for dry, dead trees because it, it, for many reasons, it's easier. <laughs> And, and it's better for the forest, really. Um, but I want to sort of sort of talk. But you talked about the bed, like building up that bow thing, and that we had started kind of with that. But thinking back to our, our river one, a good thing to start, even before you place your shelter, is make sure you place your shelter in an in an area that's going to give you the, the best fighting chance you have mm -hmm. for the air. So at the base of a waterfall is not probably the best place to stay warm for the night picking somewhere that's maybe a little further away from the water uh sheltered from the heaviest of the winds and, and it's a drier area that's going to give you some a better chance because that humidity that we felt right next to the river that was significantly colder than i'm sure it would, would have been had we gone up to the top of the hill and a little bit away from that that waterfall we would have noticed probably a 
a five or six degree temperature change in that in location alone um and that may not be like that's a feels like temperature you know what i mean that humidity made that minus five feel like minus 15 or, or so like it was quite a difference I mean, we were in minus five but it was definitely close to freezing yeah i was gonna say we almost hit well, i think we agreed it was getting close to freezing and on top of that not just the humidity uh cold air tends to sink and we were at yeah. literally like on both sides of us it was a hill and we were at the bottom of not really a ravine but we were in this kind of little gully area um yeah. and if you're gonna try and like last out on really really cold temperatures uh, especially if you have some time to plan don't go to the bottom of anything one water runs downhill so if you did have like a quick thaw you could potentially be floating away but two cold air sinks you heard it here first Mason. cold air sinks <laughs> cold air sinks <laughs> a new t-shirt right there i can see it I don't know why that struck me so funny. <laughs> uh, maybe a new, maybe a new T-shirt for the store. Cold air sinks. You heard it on Atlantic <laughs> Bushcraft. But it is true. Cold air tends to yep. go to the lower, lowest lying part, and if you happen to be in there with it, uh, you're making your life way more miserable than it needs to be. Even if you're not in a survival situation, like why go through all that extra hardship for no reason? Yeah. No. A hundred percent. So. These these are things you're thinking. I mean, just think of it on a on a cool morning where you see all the fog sort of settling. That's that kind of gives you a good idea of where the 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 more humid, cool areas are really going to be. And it's you know right on the sh shorelines, right in the little uh, divots and in, in, in valleys and, and stuff, right. So you get, kind of want to get out of that. But you also want to be away from wind because the wind strips the heat away from you. So pull yourself in under the shelter of, of like a good tree line. Go go back in the woods a little bit. Find, you know, a small opening that you can, you know, clear enough that you can set up your little shelter and, and maybe still have your fire safely but not be wind blow. Uh, what are you reading there, Robert? Yeah, I was just about to say, I was just about to call Steve out on his spelling error because it was funny, but he corrected himself. So anyway, he right. said, cold air sunks, cotton kills. And I was just about to say, you heard it here first, cold air sunks. But anyway, he corrected himself, so we'll let, we'll let him off the hook with this one. But yeah, yeah. it's very true. Cold air sinks, uh, cotton kills. Cotton is a great material for a base layer. It wicks, well, not even a base layer. It's a great layer in the summer because it wicks moisture. But... Um, it, it doesn't offer a whole lot of thermal value once it gets wet. Uh, and there's better materials out there for even when it's dry, like uh, wool. Wool is a favorite for cold weather because even when it gets wet, it retains a ton of its heat ability. What is it, 70, 70 80%, something like that, Ben? 80, I think. Yeah, yeah so, 80. I mean, if you can stand wool, wool is kind of like the golden standard in cold weather because it's uh, it's a very thick, natural material. Well, yeah, it is natural material. It's made from sheep's clothing. Well, could be sheep, could be alpaca. It could be a couple different things. There's different wools. But anyway, it's uh, it's a good material because it, it's tight-knit generally. Uh, wind doesn't get through it very well. holds a ton of body heat. And if it does happen to get wet from a little bit of sweating or if it gets damp out or something like that, you're still going to retain a lot of the heat with it. So wool is kind of the golden standard. Then you can get uh, different things like uh, polyesters and stuff like that, which some of them have benefits, some of them have negatives. Uh, that's, once again, a whole other show on its own. But do a little research and see where what is good for you, because not everybody can handle wool. I'm not a fan of wool, but if I'm going out and it's cold at all, I got a wool blanket. Like, I mean, being a little itchy, better than freezing. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I actually have a wool blanket done up with some snaps that I oftentimes will put my sleeping bag sort of inside of, kind of protect my sleeping bag, especially if I have to set up close to a fire. Yeah, and that's the other thing. Wool tends to smolder more than burn. Not that you can't burn it. Don't misunderstand. You can burn wool. I have a wool blanket that has a corner burnt off it, but it tends to smolder a little bit first. So as long as you're not right I, on top of the fire. My friend, with the right amount of heat, you can burn anything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everything I've burns. It's just at what temperature? <laughs> I've seen a rock burn. <laughs> I've seen one turn red. I've literally seen red rocks from a fire. I, uh, I, I watched a guy who was on, it was on YouTube, and I'm going to try it one of these days. He got one of those big... 
rear projection one with the big yep the uh, crts mag, the big mag fine glass in the back oh okay yeah you, you know, uh, there's a, a word on the type of light it's like lazy you know flint i can't remember the name of it anyway anyway big magnifying glass at the back of them the big square like rectangular one and he put it on a frame and he put it up and he concentrated that like meter and a half square of lens down to quarter of an inch <laughs> and he laid rocks on it on that focal point and the rocks melted and, like they burned they, they were like lava <laughs> oh man you want me to say that danny uh F fresno lens did i, did, Fres I pro did i pronounce that right i think so you're asking yeah. the dyslexic and there's a lot of e's and straight letters in that but I think it says <laughs> Fresno lens. <laughs> yeah, so I want to get one of those one of these days. I if I can roll up my pack, that's it, buddy. Me and you, we're burning the world. <laughs> oh jeez, the Atlantic bushcraft adventure death ray. But <laughs> it's only good for one square inch. <laughs> <laughs> one square inch at a time. But uh, inch. No, there, there's. Um, where did we come from? Where were we going with this? Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's another shirt <laughs> where, are we, where are we going <laughs> uh, but yeah uh, the other thing I wanted to mention with kind of the bedding underneath you is um, it bows is kind of good everybody goes to that you can use leaves and stuff like that you're going to need a lot more thickness now instead of 6 to 8 inches you might be upwards of like a foot to 16 inches because leaves compact really fast uh, and generally if they get wet they're they're it's just kind of like laying on solid ground so once again you gotta, gotta get that thermal barrier between you uh if you really want to try something that's really comfortable really fun and you have the availability to do it is if you get your like six to eight inches of boughs down and then you can do like four to six inches of uh hay basically like you know grassy type things and stuff like that that is a super comfortable bed. You can basically yeah. sleep on that with a sheet and a blanket and be happy and comfortable. Um, but of course, you know, you're not going to get stuff like that in, say, late fall, spring, winter. That's kind of like a summer thing, early fall thing. But if you ever get the chance and you're out there, and that's what I do recommend anybody listening that wants to try some of the stuff, goes out and develops their skills. Uh, it's a good time of year to develop your skills for this. Uh things are drying up it's pretty easy to find dead wood you don't have to worry about really cold temperatures you can develop those skills in a safe way in case you need them uh oh ben's ripping stuff up oh no oh that's the atlantic bushcraft contract right there it's gone he's done <laughs> he's moved on he's an evil super genius gonna take over the world oh i see gotcha knife uh, but yeah, so if you can get a good thermal barrier under you, kind of close the area in around you and thermal that in, uh, your own body heat will do a lot to keep you oh, yeah. alive. You might not be warm, you might even be borderline not comfortable, but you won't necessarily uh, expire due to the elements, you know what I mean? Um there's also some key parts of your body that loses heat really fast being things like your hands your feet your head your extremities the way the body works when it goes into hypothermia is it starts pulling all the blood from the extremities to try and get it into the center of the body and keep the major organs warm so it pulls it into your center core uh it's going to try and keep like your heart lungs liver things like that warm your brain warm and that's why your hands and feet and things like that tend to get colder first so keeping that in mind if you can keep those extremities warmer uh, it, it's going to take away from, you know, pulling that heat loss away from there. So once again, the hand warmers, a good set of, uh, camp, camp slippers. Have we figured out what those things are actually called? But anyway, even some good foot coverings, uh, wool socks, maybe a couple pair of socks with a little bit of looseness in there to get a uh, air layer to keep you warm camp booties, literally Amazon this thing and you'll see them They're They look great. They look like snow pants for your feet. I totally want to set. I have a set of damn booties. Do you? Oh, yeah. Man, you are the man, Ben. I gotta get myself a set of those. Ever since I've seen yeah. Jeremy wear them, I'm like, I want those. I don't know. Yeah, we, we ordered it. Ours are called Sundix. I'll have to check yeah, it I, out. I would bet Missy's are within almost reach of me if I, if I could just go over there and look. Uh, but no, we, we bought them online. They're, they're down, and they just go right over like your 
buy them a size big really if you're if you if you're ordering a set because but yeah and the thing is they're they're actually good enough that you can actually just put your boot on over them and they don't crush down so if you have to get up and pee or something you don't even have to take them off just put your boot on go go out do your business come back pull them out they'll fluff back up and keep your feet warm because if your feet are cold i don't care what the rest of you are you're froze <laughs> you know uh at least that is the way for me um so we talked about underneath you, we talked about getting a shelter around you. We talked about potentially throwing something inside your sleeping system to keep you warm. Uh, as long as you've kept your clothing dry, and this is the really tricky thing. If, if you have, if the clothing you've been wearing all day to set up all this got damp, you need to take that off 100% of the percent and, get, and dry it out. But if it stayed relatively dry, uh, just wearing that extra clothing in the sleep system with you is just going to keep you warm too. Uh, any any insulation that you can add is, is going to be more insulation. The other thing um, might be, and this depends on your whole situation, is other forms of body heat. Um, I, I often camp with my dog. She will quite happily lay down next to me and that provides a ton of heat. Uh, so that's an option or if you're you know i know some people get screamish about this but body heat works buddy a snuggle buddy will keep you alive i mean you'll have stories to tell at the end of it but at least you can tell those stories you gotta keep that in mind or maybe when you it's all said and done you just make that pact and never speak of this again but But I mean, I'm once good. you're done figuring out who's the big spoon or the jet pack or whatever you want to call it, I mean, jet very pack. rarely should you sleep face to face. To face. It, it makes things <laughs> awkward the next morning. <laughs> but no, all seriousness, all joking aside, uh, body heat can keep you alive. I mean, it's yeah. it, it just is what it is. It collectively uh, creates a bigger center of heat. It's easier to try and keep one mass warm uh, than it is two separate masses. So pulling your body heat together in a in an extreme situation, it's better than so, the alternative. Yeah. So combining your shelter into one smaller shelter that 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 multiple people uh, can can share that body heat gets trapped in that same area. Using those your sleep system, like pulling it in together, and so you, you can zip sleep some sleeping bags together, or just there's different ways to get physically closer to someone and, and get that that warmth to share that warmth between you. Uh, can make a huge difference in, in, a, in a dire situation if you have that option. Don't, I would not turn it down because I'm too proud. Um, I remember watching uh, Naked and Afraid, and that was literally one of the things, like some of these people that went on it, they had promised to their spouse that they wouldn't let the other person physically touch them, they wouldn't sleep. And I think that was probably one of the most foolish things I'd ever seen. I don't care what your 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 morals set at. You're you're not cheating. You're trying to stay alive to get home to your your significant other. This is not a suggestion that it has to be anything more than sharing your body. You know what I mean? It's a survival tactic at that point. If yeah. it's going to keep you alive, do it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Th- I there's very little I wouldn't consider when it comes to actual survival. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, I think human nature in general uh, and human history has proved that people will do extreme things when faced with extreme situations. So don't limit stuff out uh, because you're squeamish uh, and things like that. Because like Ben said, it could mean the difference between like if you don't want to sleep, snuggle up to somebody because whatever your principles are, that could literally mean both of you meet a terrible demise. You know what I mean? Like I, we're talking extreme yeah. situations here, but that's kind of the theme for tonight. It's better to snuggle up with somebody and get through the night and chat about it. Like we joked about than you both perish during the night. Cause that, that that's just a bad day for everybody. That's just foolishness. They, yeah. It is right. Like to a certain point that that's foolishness. Um, like I said, I, I have like, you know, the dog is, is a great example of this. Molly produces a ton of heat. For a little 35-pound dog, she produces plenty of heat. And I tell you, I uh, I, I think, have you camped with Molly? No. No, you've never had her any time we went out because we always kind of went to weird weird places. We took a motorcycle and stuff to you. Uh, she's hard to get on a motorcycle. It's really awkward. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to get her a little helmet. True. 
Uh, but those who have, many people have camped with me and Molly, and I can tell you, she's like an awesome little camp dog. Uh, you can get a good little camp dog that it's hard to beat it. She sticks around camp. She doesn't really make a lot of noise. She goes around, gets her ears scratched by everyone. She'll lay down next to anyone who's pay attention to her, especially if you give her a bit of food. Uh, so it's 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 quite a good little thing to have something like that at the camp. It's it's, it's there's a comfort to it on, on many a level. So I highly recommend everyone to get yourself a camp dog. <laughs> no, it, it's honestly if you're gonna do stuff like going out in the winter and stuff, it is another level of safety all on its own. Um, it's been years now, but I used to have a German Shepherd Sheba when I was like 16, 17, 18, getting into doing this on my own a lot and just tent camping she used to come with me and jump in i mean it was literally like a stove in yeah. the uh tent with me i hadn't done any real extremes well that's a lie tracy and i had gone out and tried to sleep in the 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 winter once in a snow cave and i think i've told the story before it collapsed on us so i mean that was probably the most extreme thing we did uh but no like you said a dog it's like having a mobile furnace that not only is it a mobile furnace uh, they offer you a little bit of comfort. Uh, it's somebody to talk to when you're on your own. I mean, they may talk back. They may not. Depends how long you've been on your own. It's hard to say. But anyway, it is companionship. Uh, it keeps you from getting bored or, you know, I, I don't like to say bored because there really is. If you're bored, you're not doing it right. <laughs> but no, it, it keeps you from getting lonely i guess is the one i'm looking at here uh, or it helps with the loneliness it adds a level of protection depending on the dog you have a chihuahua maybe not so much but you know it's still companionship uh offers a little heat it is a little bit more work trying to keep a, a pet with you uh on the go but i think it's a big payoff Oh, yeah. No, and I, I think so, too. I mean, it, like you said, it, it gives you a level of comfort. It, it gives you uh, emotionally, physically, kind of socially, because uh, you're not alone. Uh, it, it really does do a lot for you. And honestly, like uh, a good dog, especially with a nice furry coat, like my, my Molly, she's part husky. She she will uh, she, she'll uh she produces a lot of heat and, and a lot of warmth and comfort in that in that, in that regard. Uh, when you're choosing your partners to go camping, look for the big fat guys. Those produce the best heat, by the way. Like just throwing that out there for you. <laughs> I think I said during uh, whatever Nova Scotia Bushcraft Gathering was where I did the fire demonstration. <laughs> if you're going to go surviving, follow the fat guy. Yeah. Fat people survive the best because one, they never go hungry. And two, there's a ton of body heat if things go really bad. Yeah. And no, Steve, this is not a debate. All dogs, any pet, anything you want to take for companionship is a-okay. Uh, I would hesitate to take the two dogs I currently have. I got two little Boston Terriers in extreme cold weather. I think they would become more of a liability than a, a help because they are very short-haired. They don't do well in, like five degree weather let alone minus 25 if my dogs need to go pee in the winter they need boots they need sweaters potentially need hats uh it's a whole thing but other than that i during the summer wouldn't hesitate and there's still no, no. a little bit of heat there like don't get me wrong fall something like that it'd be all good but deep winter i might hesitate but only because i worry about their safety yeah no i i agree i i threw that molly was part husky and, and the thing is like on a minus 30 degree day Molly goes out, rolls in the snow, and looks at you like it's the best day of her life. You put my dog out in the summer, and she's looking at you like, what the hell are you doing to me? And where's the water so I can lay down in it? Because this is not fit. <laughs> the worst weather in the world is the hottest days for my dog. But the coldest days, she's out there, she's running around, she's dancing, she's acting a fool. It's like, you know, like anyone else's best day, right? So there's a there's a... You know, certain dogs have advantages at different times of year. I wouldn't say there's a perfect dog, although I would always argue mine are. <laughs> there's there's definitely a lot of advantages to every every breed. There's a reason they those breeds were created, and some are, are different. That's oh, for, for sure. sure. I think Steve might be a little sensitive. He has a Chihuahua. Uh, I didn't mean no disrespect to Chihuahuas. I have never owned one myself. My oldest kid has a Chihuahua, and all I can picture is in the summer. This thing still needed a sweater. So oh. <laughs> Chihuahuas are great for putting in the bottom of your sleeping bag to keep your feet warm. 
Well, he says his is just a compact little furnace. And I mean, it's going to depend a little bit individually on the animal itself. I mean, I, uh, different dogs, same breed are going to have different tolerances and like different things. So 100%, if your dog likes the weather, uh, and is comfortable by all means, any, anything you take for companionship is going to help you along like that and provide a little extra heat. Once again, I just tend to th tend to think a little bit about the safety of like, say my dogs. And I was only using it for an example. My, I had, I used to have a miniature poodle and it would love to crawl down by your feet and lay down. It was great. <laughs> of course they, they have hair, so they just grow as much as you need them. So once again, we kind of digressed a little bit there. Not really, but kind of did. Uh, so no, we talked no, about, uh, what did we talk about? We talked about bringing heat no, in with you, compacting shelters, thermal barrier under you, over you. Um, we talked about the snuggle buddy thing, if it gets real bad, which is still good. Mm -hmm. We talked about bringing, uh, and your snuggle buddy can be your pet, as we talked about, or just finished talking about here. So... <laughs> decent tent plus chihuahua equals four season comfort i mean if you're all good with it i i don't doubt you at all in all honesty like i said as long as the animal's good with it i don't doubt it um so what what's with the cup man good hot drink buddy a good hot drink there we go sorry i i did not pick up on that i was trying to flip through comments but yeah so I started, I drank my tea before the show started, but just before. And a good hot drink before you go to bed does a world of good for you. Uh, so those are things like eat a good meal before you go to bed. Nice, hot drink, preferably a warm meal. Get your shelter size down. Insulate the walls as best you can. Insulate your sleep system as best you can. Right? Heat it any way you can, whether it's with a buddy, with with your uh, heat packs, with your dog, anything you can do to produce more heat in a small shelter is going to make a huge difference at how you sleep compared to what it's like outside. You get these these combinations built up, you know, a good shelter with an okay sleeping bag, but then adding everything else into it. You can sleep in a minus 40 degree weather outside in relatively comfort in a sleeping bag that's definitely not designed for it. But you've, by doing it, the way you've done this is by adding up all these these factors and, and getting yourself over that edge. No, for sure. And everything we talked about, it's not the one-off that's going to make the difference. It's do as many as you can to yeah. help your situation out. And I, I guess the last thing I just kind of want to throw in there uh, is kind of the Cadillac to this, uh, or Cadillac solution to this problem, if you have the availability hot tented and you you know yourself ben you you've done hot tenting you can get some pretty cool weather and stay relatively warm with a good because all you're doing is pulling the fire inside the space now with you so if you have the space just big enough for you uh your little hot tent and enough air circulation so you don't suffocate yourself of course you can stay pretty warm so did you see jeremy's video a few weeks or last week uh, the last one I seen was the hot tent giveaway. Oh, he did one a little while ago that I actually enjoyed. That, sorry, Jeremy. If you, if you... <laughs> Some of I haven't, maybe. Uh, he did one with a lantern. He heated his hot tent with a lantern. And I think he got six to eight degrees difference between the inside of his hot tent and the outside with just a lantern. Now, he used a slightly thicker walled canvas tent with a... Uh, with snow flaps, so he had a relatively sealed area, but he did have a chimney, so he wasn't even capturing all that heat, but a lot, making sure that the, the bad gases and stuff went out. And what that lantern did, just going up that chimney, like the heat going out, you can watch heat coming out of the chimney, uh, still created a six to eight degree difference inside the tent than outside. So any little bit of heat you can bring into a confined shelter, it adds a lot. Um, so just a couple of candles, uh, believe it or not, especially in something like a, a, a Quincy hut or an insulated hut will make a world of difference compared to what it's like outside. So it's just something to keep in mind. His lantern was just one of those little, uh, I, I call them kerosene or paraffin wax, mm -hmm. liquid paraffin uh, candles, uh, things like that. 
believe it or not, these those little uh, candle lanterns you can buy, those will create a fair bit of heat. And you can light one of those into a shelter and it'll make a big difference. Uh, so things like that will also make a difference. But using all these factors to, to bring the temperature up can get you through a cold night a hell of a lot better. And the reality is these are great to know things because you never know when you get out there and a piece of gear will fail or, or become missing. So you go out on, say, a, a canoe trip uh, late in the year and you flip over and your sleeping bag gets absolutely soaking. Now you're out of sleep system. That doesn't mean you have to freeze to death. Those temperatures can drop to negative that night. You're going to be in a hard shape. But you can, you can survive. You can do well. And you use what you have and what's available. And some of that is, is following these systems. In that case, I'd probably end up incorporating my canoe as part of my, my shelter. That could be one wall. Um, nope. And I guess the end is your imagination is the only thing that's going to limit you. So yeah. we just offer suggestions on ways that you can do things. Uh, think outside the box. Like, perfect example, your canoe being integrated in there. It's 100% waterproof. Uh, is if you can get it, you know, the, the canoe itself, it's waterproof, windproof, uh, relatively small area. Like you could do a lot of stuff with that. So think about that. Maybe you have to change your, like, look at your natural surroundings, I guess more what I'm looking at. Uh, and yeah. you can do a lot. Don't what things don't limit yourself. Um, always be looking, always think outside the box, keep this stuff in your head. And it, it's literally just tools in the toolbox. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I think for me, uh, that's pretty much to the end of this. Uh, I just seen one comment that Troy made way back when we started. And I was trying to circle back to it a couple times and kind of get off base a little bit. Uh, so Troy said his daughter's over in Happy Valley, Goose Bay. They had 80 centimeters of snow yesterday and a really cold wind chill. 80 centimeters of snow. Lucky. Right? Like it's snowshoe time. But <laughs> yeah, no, I, I seen that in the weather forecast a couple of days ago, and they said like major snowfall for the east coast. And I'm like, aren't we east coast? But it wasn't this east coast, it was like north of us in, in lab. But uh, no, uh, yeah, that's that would be for, for us, people like me and you, and, and a lot of our, our, our listeners that would be real fun to get out and, and do something with 80 centimeters of snow. That's you're getting into the area where you could start building snow shelters. Oh yeah. So. Well, if, in fact, you're not getting into the area. That is the area you can build some snow shelters. In fact, even if you just had a little bit of a shelter built and allowed that 80 centimeters to sit on top of it, now it's well insulated. Very well insulated. You literally could warm that with, and that's what I was kind of talking about with the snow at the start is, yeah. uh, if you like igloos, uh, Northern Canada, stuff like that and igloos, they literally have historically heated those with a little bit of uh, basically oil lamps made from blubber from seals and stuff like that. Like once you can get the cold air, like wind and stuff from coming in at you, you can heat up stuff in there pretty good. The inside melts a little bit until it basically forms a, a layer of ice. And then it basically is really easy to keep that warmer than outside. Like you said, you might reach right. that zero degrees, one degree, something like that. You're still going to need, you know, your blankets and a good sleep system. You're not going to be running around in your underwear, perfectly happy and warm. But it's still like one degree inside is far better than minus 40 outside and say the Arctic. So and with them, the, the igloos, they would oftentimes have access to furs. So you would have two or three layers of fur as your as your floor. Nope, sorry. Steve just said something that caught me as funny. His chihuahua is a furnace and a lean meal on day eight. <laughs> <laughs> and I just glanced at it at the corner of my eye and lost it. Sorry. Oh, wow. Well, that's a sin, poor thing. <sighs> anyway, he better, kids. Better he kids. Off. We know he kids. We all kid here. Better off getting a couple of squirrels, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, a couple of furs in, in an igloo type thing, if you were in, in more of a traditional one, I believe it could get caribou furs or seal furs would be oftentimes laid down on the floor. And honestly, like, you could be down to your 
your underwear in a situation like that. If you got a nice warm thing to sit on, you got a little lamp radiating some heat, you can push some of those up against the wall. You have, you know, you can make a huge difference in one of those. Uh, so once you get things figured out, you can get a lot more comfortable and you can really get your advantages. Uh, and like you said, it's thinking a little outside of the box. It's, it's edging every little advantage you can because getting it in one fell swoop, that's hard. Getting it by, by edging those different layers, you know, multiplying it with your shelter, with your sleep system, with your heating system, with, with your, your, the way you eat, every one of these things will give you those few degrees and a few degrees here and a few degrees there. Next thing you know, you're warm and comfortable. And that's the big thing. Don't try and accomplish everything with one solution. It very rarely works. And the other thing is you got to practice this stuff. It's good to have it up here, but if you've never put it in practical use, you don't know how it's going to work out for you. So like we always suggest everybody, if you're going to take and try any of these things, do it in a controlled environment where you can see the results. Cause you may not get it right the first time. We don't get it right on the 70th time. Like sometimes we figure we've been doing something one way for years and then find a slightly better way just because necessity made us do it a different way. And we're like, oh God, that's a so much better way of doing things. It's always learning. So try these things in a controlled environment, see how it works out for you and see what you like. Maybe you'll come up with better ideas than we just gave you and you can come back to us and give us ideas. That's kind of what it's all about. I mean, you said 70, but we've been trying this podcast for 90 shows and we still don't have it right. Oh, that's <laughs> In 3,000 more attempts, I'm still not going to have it right. I don't ever profess to know everything. But Anyway, it's all. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I hope you guys get out and enjoy the outdoors. I know I can't wait for my next trip. Uh, it won't be this weekend, unfortunately, but maybe come out. Um I, I definitely will be getting out again soon. I got some hot tending that I have to do again this year for sure. I really enjoy that. Uh, and I know I'm going to be dragging Robert out as soon as they let him go camping again. <laughs> yeah, as soon as this craziness is kind of halted again. But Anyway, yeah, I think that was a pretty good topic for or a pretty good show for tonight. We're into it for an hour, which was actually longer than I thought. I figured this was going to be a 45-minute show. But uh, before we leave off, if anybody is still interested, we still have decals and shirts and stuff like that for sale at the store, which you can find uh, down there, AtlanticBushcraft.ca. Click on the left-hand side of the shopping cart. It'll bring you to the store or store.AtlanticBushcraft.ca. And there's still time to get orders in if you want to get them before Christmas. Just saying. They make great gifts. I see you smiling, but I don't know if that's a good one or a bad one. <laughs> uh, that's the best thing about my smile. Eh? <laughs> it could go either way, man. <laughs> you can look and think this is either going to be pure joy or pure pain. <laughs> Anyways, everyone have a great night, and we'll be talking. Night, guys. We'll see you next night time. Off.